I suggest we, we start. Um, my name is Antoine Madelin. I'm the advocacy director for FIDH, International Federation for Human Rights, an organization which has the honor of having uh, the Barron Center for Human Rights uh, and the Barron uh, Service for Human Rights as two uh, active members of our organization. Um, we will discuss the situation in, in, in Bahrain and most particularly the question of the status of uh, human rights defenders in the country, uh, in particular with a particular focus on those who are currently detained. It will be an opportunity for us to um, uh, draw uh, a map of the current situation as well as an exchange of views on what are the uh, advocacy opportunities to uh, leverage uh, influence on the government uh, on that situation. So this discussion is taking place on the occasion of the 45th session of the Human Rights Council, which, has, um, which is in, in session uh, right now. Um, and, um, and, 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 and just as an introduction, I will mention the fact that a, 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 a number of international human rights organizations from uh, Article 19, uh, Civicus, uh, the PENS, uh, Human Rights Watch, uh, Reporters Without Borders, OMCT, I will not name them all, uh, uh, together with Bahraini human rights organizations uh, that are present today, have addressed a joint letter to the members of the Human Rights Council for them to be uh, vocal on the situation uh, in the country uh, and to ask the Bahraini government to release unconditionally uh, all the protesters, uh, activists and human rights defenders and lawyers that have, have been detained. So this is against this background uh, that we are holding this discussion to further enter into more details on the um, uh, situation. So we will start uh, our exchange as uh, uh, in uh, analyzing the attacks on civil society and the state of play of um, uh, human rights defenders that are detained. And we will then move in the second part of our exchanges uh, into analyzing uh, what could be advocacy activities, what, have been, what has been done so far and what could work uh, in the future. So to start with, um, I will give the floor to Hussein Abdullah. Uh, thank you very much for hosting this uh, session, Hussein. Um, originally from Bahrain, you're the founder and executive director of Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain, ADHRB, as well as the Bahrain Institute for Human Rights and Democracy, BERG. Um, in, in 2012, as a direct result, I should say, of uh, your advocacy, and of the human rights work that you carry on Bahrain and that you have been carrying uh, since then uh, uh, at the Human Rights Council in particular, um, you uh, have been a victim of an act of reprisal from the Bahraini authorities uh, who have uh, stripped you of your Bahraini citizenship uh, in a totally uh, arbitrary uh, manner. Um, so, Hussein, you, you will give us some introductory remarks uh, about the overall situation in, in the country and, and, and share with us a, a message which um, uh, imprisoned human rights defenders uh, have drafted and are sending to the Human Rights Council. Hussein, you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Antonio. Thank you, colleague. Um, I'll, make, I'll make my remark uh, uh, very short as my colleague Emily going to uh, divulge further in, in the topics that Antonio uh, uh, raised. Uh, as you all know, uh, Bahrain is a member of the Human Rights Council and that membership comes with obligation, comes with a duty, uh, a, a state that is a voting member of the council need to take upon themselves to make sure that things at home first uh, are stable and human rights are respected and protected before they start lecturing other, other countries and take the ro role of leadership or uh, uh, the protector 
uh, uh, of human rights. So as Bahrain is a member of the council, unfortunately, what we see is the total uh, uh, hypocrisy. We see Bahrain uh, not cooperating uh, with the special procedure. We, we see Bahrain not uh, uh, allowing special procedures or even a non-government organization to visit the country uh, freely and, and do their own assessment. You know, when Bahrain uh, 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 raise concern or do their own intervention in the council under item five and uh, item six, and we all know these two items relate to UPR and relate to uh, working with the council, they encourage other states to be constructive in their relationship with the uh, special procedure. However, Bahrain itself has not allowed a special mandate or a special procedure to visit the country in years. You know, a non-government organization like Antonio, you, you stated in the beginning, have clearly stated their position in the country. However, it's not only the concern of the non-government organization that has been uh, lingering over the situation in Bahrain, but also the special procedure. Uh, just uh, uh, two weeks ago, we had a letter issued by the working group on arbitrary detention to the Bahraini government regarding the uh, situation of minors who have been arrested and sentenced to long uh, 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 sentencing or long years in prison, uh, despite clear evidence of uh, a coerced confession. We have a decision that recently uh, 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 came out also from the well-established and well-respected uh, working group of uh, uh, arbitrary detention uh, basically stated uh, uh, nine uh, Bahrainis have been convicted of different charges, all of them or majority of them related to terrorism in a cell Bahrain called, uh, quote, and, uh, quote uh, Hezbollah, end quote, uh, the working group detail all the uh, uh, torture and, 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 and uh, ill treatment and the coerced confession and lack of due process that these individuals went through. So the picture, unfortunately, today, when, when I compare it to last year or the year before, th there is systematic uh, uh, violations in the country. There is a, a, a heavy hammer approach to civil society. Uh, it's very difficult for our colleague who still some of them out of prison or those who are out of prison to continue their work of uh, human rights to document and to communicate with the international community. Now, uh, the, the, uh, uh, we receive different messages from human rights defenders who are in prison, whether it's Naji Fatil, whether it's Dr. Abd Jalil Singhais, or as recent as our dear colleague uh, uh, and mentor, uh, Mr. Abdul Hadi Khawaja, and others uh, uh, about their situation, uh, about how they are getting uh, uh, treated in prison, which is certainly concerning. But I want to take these two minutes I have left uh, to basically uh, send, uh, uh, deliver a message that we have received from several human rights defenders uh, in Bahraini prison to the Human Rights Council. And the message is that there has to be an action. There has to be either a joint statement or even as high as a resolution on Bahrain. They, uh, you know, as a reminder, Back in 2014, back in 2013, we had uh, dozens of human rights defenders in Bahrain coming to Geneva, meeting with the international community, advocating for peaceful change, respect for human rights, uh, uh, offering uh, the reality on the ground. However, now, since the council is stopped, uh, uh, led uh, mainly by uh, or led by uh, Switzerland and other like-minded countries, to put Bahrain uh, uh, on the agenda and to introduce joint statement and even go as high as discussing possible resolution if the country does not take uh, 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 practical uh, uh, measures or actionable measures. These human rights defenders uh, uh, want the council to basically uh, uh, put Bahrain again uh, uh, on the agenda, introduce a joint resolution, clearly call for the release of political prisoners uh, uh, heads on uh, discuss the issue, the culture of impunity in the country, how some officials, despite well-documented cases of human rights abuses, there still are free to travel, come to Western countries like the United States, United Kingdom, go, go to Switzerland, have, you know, have these uh, uh, vacation, despite the fact they are engaged in systematic human rights violations. Culture of impunity is one of the issues that the international community need to address. That's the message we have received from the uh, uh, different human rights defenders 
uh, from the Bahraini program. Thank you. Thank you very much, Hussein, and I think it's um, very well received, at least on, on our part. Um, I'll now give the floor to Khalid Ibrahim. Khalid um, is the um, executive director of the Gulf Center for Human Rights in charge of the management of program development, fundraising and training. He's an Iraqi human rights defender uh, with uh, decades of human rights experience in the, the field. Um, Khalid, uh, and thank you also for co-hosting this event. Um, following Hussein Abdullah's um, introduction, could you also further uh, expand on the situation of human rights defenders? And in particular, um, could you also give us an update on the precise situation of um, the prominent human rights defender Abdul Hadi Al Hawaja, whom uh, Hussein has just mentioned, who's a co founder of the Gulf Center for Human Rights and who was given a life sentence in uh, 2011? And with your mic on, would work better for us. Uh, thank you, Antoine. Thank you, everybody, for making time to attend this sad event. It is a honor for me to talk about uh, a unique human rights defender, Abdul Hadi Khawaja, my colleague, who joined uh, uh, me in Frontline Defenders in 2008. This is not about uh, an ordinary story. This is a, a story about a champion of change. Abdul Hadi Khawaja, as Amina coordinator, uh, for frontline defenders, he moved everywhere. He defended the rights of Palestinians, Western Saharans, and others. Really, he's an international human rights figure. So uh, one day he called me and he told me, Khalid, I resigned. I told him, we didn't discuss that. He told me, I don't have time to discuss that with anybody. I want to be with my people. There is an uprising in Bahrain. That is back in 2011. So he, he left a luxury job, a job that um, in a way or another the, is opportunity for any defender to serve uh, the whole human rights movement in MENA. He left all that just to be with his, his people. And on the 6th of uh, April, I called him talking about another project, the Gulf Center for Human Rights. And he told me in, uh, in Arabic, ala barakatillah, with, uh, Allah bless him. go and uh, let us move in this project. Three days later, on the 9th of April, 2011, he disappeared, taken from his, uh, the house of his son-in-law, uh, disappeared for two weeks, tortured, and then uh, really uh, sentenced in a short trial uh, for life. Why? Just due to his peaceful and legitimate human rights activities. I just want to update you about, you know, some aspects of his life in prison. Abdel Hadi is he's the one who said human rights never ended in prison. In actual fact, it will start in prison. And he, he meant that. He went through more than 500 strikes just to uh, demand the rights of the prisoners uh, and himself and his colleagues. We know very for sure that uh, the Nelson Mandela rules, the United Nations uh, minimum standards for the treatment of prisoners never implemented in our countries, including Bahrain. So Abdel Hadi, he wanted with his peaceful activities to force authorities to implement these rules. Abdel Hadi, when he went to prison, he, he was 50, now he's 60, 10 years, 10 years for a peaceful and innocent citizen to be in prison is too much. Now, during this time uh, in prison, he got three grandchildren, Aqila, Tahar, and Abdel Hadi, while in prison to have some grandchildren, that is really painful. Uh, when he went to prison, uh, Jude was just one years old. Now, uh, Jude, uh, now a lovely girl, 11 years of old and really always talking about her grandfather. Now, during the torture, uh, the severe torture that he was subjected to, he needed many, many uh, medical interventions. And uh, as such, uh, there are still some metal plates uh, in his face. 
uh, in particular his Jew, uh, and they need to be removed. Two years ago, doctor, the doctor told him that he needs to, to remove these metal plates, but authorities are not uh, addressing that. So he has some pain due to these uh, metal uh, plates that should be removed in a, an operation that authority are delaying all the time. Now, uh, Abdel Hadi, he managed to write two books while in prison. That's another humorous work while in prison. He wrote a book about history of Bahrain and another book about his childhood for his grandchildren to read about how he, uh, he uh, went through uh, a kind of an exciting childhood in Bahrain. Also, he planted some trees, trees, green. Everybody loves the green. Abdul Hadi planted some trees, but authorities, they cut the trees, unfortunately. Uh, Abdul Hadi always in his calls, very optimistic. Really, his smile always uh, part of his, uh, his, his face. It's, it's within his anatomy of his face. It is not something that he, he could make just for a show. No, it is part of his face. Always he's smiling, always he's optimistic for somebody who is uh, uh, sentenced to life and to have the time to laugh with his uh, uh, family and to, to smile. Really, that is a reflection of how strong is his personality. Now, uh, because of uh, all his actions, I mentioned the hunger strikes, his health was affected. On one occasion, he, he went through more than 100 days of hunger strike. So he's not really seen clearly in, in one of his eyes. So he's just using one eye. Uh, and also, uh, uh, I have to say that uh, because of his demands now, uh, uh, he's not uh, required to have a chain in his feet while going to hospitals. They used to force them and Abdul Hadi refused that. Uh, and also he got a library, books, but they confiscated all the books. Recently they promised him that they will get the books back to him, but they didn't do that uh, so far. Now, the other uh, story about Abdul Hadi is always he, he's encouraging the human rights movement in, in Bahrain to be united, to uh, work together, to have a peaceful change uh, in Bahrain, to end the discrimination, to end all the attacks on uh, civil society organizations. We are not going to do that with a conflict. Always Abdul Hadi is a, a man who is looking for unity and for uh, a voice for all the voiceless. A lot of violations are uh, going out there there in Bahrain, and always we, we, we hear about uh, the citizens who are deprived from civil and human rights. And the only way to address all that is through really uh, working together and addressing all the uh, problems that uh, we are having now in Bahrain. I know there is no any uh, local remedy to address all these violations, but still we have strong international advocacy and we have some reliable partners in, uh, in, in the region and all that always could uh, get uh, a peaceful uh, change in Bahrain. So from here, I really, I would like to express my admiration, my full uh, admiration of, uh, uh, and, and to say that I'm so proud of the work that conducted by my colleague Abdul Hadi uh, outside the prison and in it, and also to uh, wish the human rights movement in Bahrain every success in their struggle to get freedom in Bahrain. Thank you so much. Thank you, Khalid. And yes, um, we share indeed the uh, fact that um, Abdul Hadi and as well as his family are all an inspiration to us as human rights defenders. Um, I'll now give the floor to Devin Kenny. Um, Devin Kenny uh, is the researcher on Bahrain as well as other Arab Gulf countries for Amnesty International. He's based in Amnesty International. Ah, I don't know. I, 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 sharing with us. Uh, my No. 
the music has stopped. Yeah, so no, we go. <laughs> it's removed. I think there's somebody always we are having that problem. To, yeah. Yeah. Um, so apologies for this. So I was now calling on Devin Kenny, who's an amnesty researcher on Bahrain, as well as for other Gulf countries based in uh, Beirut for Amnesty International. Um, uh, Devin, and in fact, from Amnesty's point of view, uh, uh, what is uh, left for human rights work to deploy in, in, in Bahrain? And can you give us a little more of a your analysis on, on, on the state of play of civil society in the country, as well as um, uh, an analysis on how the government reacts to basically any human rights work that is carried out independently in the country? Um, I fear that Devin has uh, disappeared. No, he's there. I think he will start now. Hello? Yes, please, uh, Devin, uh, you have the floor. Uh, okay, sorry, I'm having a lot of technical issues today, but it seems you can hear me now, so we should be good. Um, yeah, and thanks to uh, the Zoom bomber that always uh, adds a note of excitement to these proceedings. Um, so yeah, I'm going to uh, focus on the history um, and current situation of the Bahrain Center for Human Rights, BCHR, as a kind of case study of human rights work in Bahrain and the limitations imposed on that work by the government. Um, just a caveat at the beginning, BCHR is not the only Bahraini human rights organization, um, far from it. There's another one on the ground called the Bahrain Human Rights Society in Arabic, that's Al Jama'iya, Al Bahraini Al Hukuk Al Insan. They were licensed in 2001, and they're the only other one headquartered in Bahrain. And then there's a whole uh, alphabet soup of orgs um, that are headquartered outside Bahrain, but of course work. Uh, with sourcing in Bahrain. And that, of course, includes Amnesty International. It includes the other organizations represented with us here today, uh, ADHRB and GCHR, it includes BIRD and Salam in UK, and the Bahrain Forum for Human Rights in Lebanon. So there's uh, a lot of orgs working on the issue, but I think uh, BCHR is sort of the most illuminating as a case study because I would say that they were the most active, the most structured, and the most bold group um, that was actually working on the ground headquartered in Bahrain. So BCHR, their story goes like this. They sought registration with the government in 2002, and they succeeded. They were licensed by the government. 2002 is it's sort of the crucial year in the quote unquote reform process or reform period of Bahraini history, which is more or less the period uh, between 1999 and 2010. 1999, the new king came in, King Hamad, um, and lifted uh, to some extent the very high level of, of repression that had prevailed under his father um, and announced that there would be you know, quote, a lot of reforms, including some opening to civil society and some tinkering with government. So BCHR um, sort of seized this opportunity or um, took the moment um, as an opportunity to, to test that it was what it said, um, that the king's word was, as he said, truly a period of opening and reform. They were licensed in 2002. Uh, they only survived as a legal entity until 2004. So uh, about two years. What happened was in September 2004, um, BCHR's executive director, uh, Abdel Hadi Al Khawaja, who's been mentioned a lot here already, uh, gave a speech and the government um, immediately, uh, within days, if not within a single day, uh, dissolved the organization and um, put uh, Mr. Al Khawaja in jail. 
The content of his speech or what he said was he had denounced the prime minister of Bahrain, um, Khalifa bin Salman al Khalifa, who's been prime minister for, I think, approaching 50 or maybe even a bit over 50 years now for the entire independent history of Bahrain um, since Britain departed the country as a, as a colonial or imperial power. They've never changed prime ministers. So um, al Khawaja's speech. Um, denounced that and called for his resignation, um, which then immediately led to him being put in jail. He was held for about two months and was later released on a royal pardon. BCHR was dissolved. Um, there were a couple interesting notes about how it was dissolved. One is that so it was dissolved by order of the Ministry of Labor and Social Affairs. The officials signing the order for the ministry were both members of the Al Khalifa ruling family. So essentially two family members ordering an organization outlawed for criticizing a member of their own family. It's a pretty obvious conflict of interest and also is illustrative of where power lies within Bahrain's structure of government. Um, it's also of note that the center, BCHR, was ordered to turn over all of their documentation, all of it, uh, to a government appointed liquidator, um, which of course is hugely problematic for a human rights org that's been documenting uh, violations of people's human rights by a government to then have to or be ordered legally to hand over that very sensitive documentation to the government accused of the human rights violations or to someone directly appointed by the government. Um, so what were the charges that were used in shutting down BCHR and in jailing Al Khawaja? The charges were, and I'll quote here, grave violations of public order and instigating public hatred against the government. Um, those are quotes as carried by one of the semi-official uh, daily newspapers, the English language paper, Gulf Daily News. So it's a straightforward case of shutting the organization down because it had, had passed a political red line um, in exercising its freedom of expression. Um, very straightforward case as is reflected in the charges. They were openly shut down for that reason. Um, there are also a couple of things that are of note about this 2004 incident shutting BCHR down um, that are just sort of important for understanding the political context and political dynamics in Bahrain. Uh, one, of course, which is sort of the thrust of my whole presentation here, is that the so-called reform process then, and by extension, any talk of reform in Bahrain that you might see today, uh, has its limits. It has uh, very sharp red lines. So the red line then, which, which is still in place, is if you offer principled criticism of a pillar of government or the structure of government, or in this case, even a personality in government, that's the end. As an organization, you can be shut down, and as an ind individual, you can <clears throat> face prosecution and prison. That's that's where the government draws the line in human rights work in Bahrain or uh, any kind of civil society work. Um, the other point is uh, just a significant thing to note about the political dynamic in Bahrain. Um, it gets a bit tricky um, because like in many contexts where you have a long-term pattern of uh, extreme repression by a government, the lines between human rights work and political opposition can start to become somewhat blurred, um, which isn't necessarily a criticism, but it's a tricky thing and a thing to note. And you have seen that happening in Bahrain as in many other national contexts um, where the government is a very persistent and aggressive human rights abuser is you get to a situation where to recommend the kind of changes that need to be made to address human rights abuses to a large extent you're tackling the government itself and so in this case the call made by Mr. Al Khawaja was for the prime minister to resign which might ordinarily be said to be in the realm of a political demand um, but which of course has justifications given uh, how implicated the government he led has been in human rights violations in Bahrain over many decades so it's just a tricky area I wish to flag, and it's further, it's further complicated in the Bahraini context because 
if you have, so you have human rights work and there's a certain degree of connection with the spectrum of political opposition. And then in the Bahraini context, political opposition is very closely associated with Shia ethnic identity. So this starts to create a tricky and very polarized uh, dynamic, um, which you can see it beginning then and it's carried through to today. And this is the story of where we are today. If we move forward to 2011, um, Mr. al Khawaja, uh, who was himself Shia and a large group of other Shia civic leaders, uh, whether they're from political opposition or civil rights groups, excuse me, human rights groups, or the press. Basically, the bulk of the Shia civic leadership was imprisoned that year in 2011 because of their position, uh, because of their participation in uh, the mass demonstrations of that year. And they remain in prison to today, including Mr. Al Khawaja, as we've just heard. Um, Nabil Rajab was another key figure within BCHR, uh, a founding member and active throughout the life of the organization, um, also uh, Shia ethnically. He's been in and out of prison for this entire current period in Bahraini history. So what I'm classifying is the, <clears throat> the period of sort of a recrudescent uh, repression from 2011 to, to now, which we see. Uh, Nabil Rajab has been in prison, uh, I think, at least for the half of that time, possibly for the majority of it, in and out of prison. This particular year, he's been released on a probationary term. Probation, by definition, means you're under threat of going back to jail if uh, you commit another violation of law. And in Bahrain, since it is defined as a violation of law or treated and implemented as a violation of law to critique the government, he is under uh, threat, uh, pretty overt, of being returned to jail if he says anything overtly critical. So <clears throat> he's out of jail, but that is illustrative of how curtailed the space to say anything is or to do any kind of human work, human rights work is. There's also exile, many Bahrainis, and especially many Bahrainis who have been active in human rights organizations have been pushed into exile. Uh, Sayed, Yuf Sayed Yusuf in Muhafaza is another guy who has been a staff member of BCHR for since near the beginning and has been very active all along. He was ultimately pressed, uh, forced into leaving Bahrain due to his work with BCHR and currently has asylum in Germany. So <clears throat> BCHR actually does uh, continue to attempt to do some work on the ground, um, quietly doing documentation work, avoiding getting arrested uh, if they can. Um, but it's, it's been pretty effectively suppressed uh, by these means, uh, outright jailing of leaders, um, threat of jailing, which is sufficient to silent pe silence people exile for those who are able to escape jail and get abroad. And I would say the overall the story of BCHR tells us the story of Bahraini government policy and of uh, human rights work in Bahrain, which is that in this country, human rights work is effectively illegal, um, as is really any principled uh, criticism of the government. And that unfortunately is where we are still today. And those are my remarks, thanks. Thank you very much, um, Devin. Um, now we will move um, to the second part of our exchanges. Uh, in fact, taking from what we've learned on the attacks against civil society, and in that context, the full impunity enjoyed by the Bahraini authorities to do so, um, we will now uh, discuss what can be an appropriate mobilization of the international community uh, to leverage influence on the situation. Uh, and to start with, we will um, speak with uh, Emily Marietta. Emily is an advocacy assistant at uh, ADHRB. She's a law graduate with specialization in international law, UN system and human rights mechanisms. Um, she's currently representing ADHRB at the Human Rights Council in session in Geneva, and we can see indeed behind you where you are, 
that you are in the council for those of us who are familiar uh, with the serpent bar or the whereabouts of the serpent. But uh, Emily, um, what can you tell us about this culture of impunity that the Barney government enjoys and, and, and what could be the role the international community uh, play uh, in response to that, especially at the Human Rights Council where you're right now? Um, thank you very much, Anton, for giving me the floor, and thank you all for being here. Indeed, I am speaking from the Human Rights Council in Geneva. And today, I would like to take this opportunity to raise concerns over the pervasive culture of impunity in Bahrain, which continues to be the fuel and the reason behind the ongoing human rights systematic violations in the country. The abuses, which are often perpetuated and or overseen by individuals within the highest levels of the government, are met with an absolute lack of accountability in Bahrain. The systematic violation appear to be the result of a well-established policy that not only perpetuates a culture of impunity, but also creates a system of incentives that aim to reward the perpetrators. As the Bahraini government has gradually tasked the Ministry of Interior with enforcing new and more oppressive restrictions on fundamental freedoms, the most ruthless officers are often promoted rather than punished. Since uh, 2011, when Bahrain's mass pro-democracy protests were violently suppressed by the security forces, the government of Bahrain has only intensified its campaign against civil society and peaceful political opposition, imposing increasingly draconian restrictions on um, basic freedoms and civil and, liber and, and political liberties that stifled progress across the full spectrum of human rights in Bahrain. Especially after 2017, hundreds of human rights defenders, journalists, political opposition leaders, and Shia religious figures have been summoned, interrogated, arrested, physically and psychologically tortured and abused and threatened for their families and jobs. And the um, torture and abuse do not only occur during arrest and interrogation, but continue during incarceration. Bahrain's prison system is notorious for its poor living conditions, for the denial of adequate health care, and for the rampant abuse against inmates. And too many are the victims that experience abusive treatment for the simple exercise of their rights, from Nabil Rajab to Al Kawaja to Abdusam Al Saheg and Naya Yusuf, among many, many others. ADHRB analyzed over a 1,000 of incidents of abuse comprising more than 3,000 specific human rights violations directly attributable to the Ministry of Interior from 2011 to the present day. And these included arbitrary detention, torture, rape, and extrajudicial killings. So what we can say is that these serious trends of abuse prove that systematic human rights violations in Bahrain are the product of de facto policies that perpetuate a culture of impunity. Indeed, the Bahraini criminal justice system is awash with impunity, which entrenches the belief that Bahraini authorities are at all effects, at all extent, above the law. At every level of the Ministry of Interior, there is a pattern of police brutality and repression. And we see that while authorities have been aggressively prosecuting individuals solely for exercising their freedom to expression, to association and to peaceful assembly, there have been very few prosecutions of security personnel directly implicated in the severe and widespread abuses documented. Since 2011, the Barini government has consistently ensured that any kind of accountability for human rights abuses committed by authorities and by high-ranking officials is virtually non-existent. Those that have been prosecuted have largely been low-ranking officer, officers, and even with these instances, many have resulted in acquittals or disproportionately light sentences. 
such a system has clearly set the conditions for officers and security personnel to systematically commit uh, crimes and human rights violations and still feel protected, being ensured of not being persecuted and nor even questioned about the violation. And it has to be noted that such a system directly stems from the top government leadership, entailing the responsibility of top of the chain office officials. An appalling demonstration of how uh, impunity is deeply rooted and institutionalized in Bahrain came from the famous interaction between the Prime Minister Khalifa bin Salman al Khalifa with an officer of the Minister of Interior, where the former said, and I quote, these laws cannot be applied to you. No one can touch this bond between us. Whoever applies these laws against you applies them to us. We are one body. So as it appears, the Bahraini Ministry of Interior, which is headed by Rashid bin Abdullah Al Khalifa since 2004, uh, as Devin was mentioning before, operates as an extension of the royal family and it is to all effects above the law. Whatever crime and human rights, are commit human rights violations are committed by its officers, they are granted with full immunity. Min uh, Ministry um, Rashid bin Abdullah Al Khalifa should be held accountable under the international principle of superior responsibility. In any other country with a minimum respect of human rights and of international obligations, he would be questioned, prosecuted, and fired for implementing policies that go against any simple standard of human rights and human decency. But what we see is that, on the contrary, the Bahraini Minister of the Interior is still in his position. He has been rewarded by the king and continues to be the face of the blood and human rights violations in the country. But let me provide another example of how uh, the culture of impunity is deeply rooted in Bahrain. Nowhere indeed is impunity more so afforded than to Prince Nasir bin Hamad al Khalifa, which is, who is nicknamed the Torture Prince of Bahrain. As the son of the king, Prince Nasir enjoys a high ranking military role and has been promoted to a Royal Guard Commander of the country. And this is despite the manifest evidence pro proving that he has been directly involved in the torture of activists during the 2011 pro-democracy protests. What can be said at an international level is that in 2014, due to the strength and legitimacy of evidence against Prince Nasir, the United Kingdom High Court decided to lift Prince Nasir's diplomatic immunity regarding the prosecution of torture allegations. But nevertheless, Prince Nasir is still entrusted with organizing and attending large-scale global events and continues to be regularly and freely allowed to visit um, the UK, as well as the US, France, and Germany, without being held accountable nor questioned about the crimes he has directly, allegedly committed, but rather he continues to receive warm welcomes from governments that have a supposed focus on the achievement of human rights. So, as it appears, the responsibility of such widespread impunity cannot be exclusively ascribed to the Al Khalifa family since the complicity of the Western powerful allies of Bahrain, such as the UK, the US, France, and Germany, is fueling and legitimizing this impunity at an international level. We consider that unless this culture of impunity is addressed both locally and internationally, the country cannot move forward on any right path towards the promotion and the respect of human rights. Specifically, we believe that in order to end this culture of impunity, the international community should impose sanctions on key perpetrators across the Ministry of Interior and within the Bahraini government, including the Prime Minister and Prince Nasser bin Hamad al Khalifa. Also, the government of Bahrain should fully implement uh, all the recommendations that 
it received from several UN mandate holders and should seriously reform its judiciary and its uh, existing um, accountability mechanism in ensuring that these are independent and effect effective. At last, I would also like to briefly focus on the huge issue of recent cases of death penalties in Bahrain that are very concerning. Currently in Bahrain, there are, there are 12 victims of torture who have been sentenced to death through unfair trials and are now facing imminent execution. All of these prisoners have been tortured, judged, and sentenced to death with evidence exclusively based on court's confessions. Therefore, with the due process standards not being respected, the death penalties faced by these 12 individuals manifestly appear to be unlawful, since in contravention with international law and with many international treaties, such as in particular the ICCPR, which has been ratified by Bahrain. Among these 12 victims, the cases of uh, Mohammed Ramadan and Hussein Musa are uh, emblematic also due to the high international resonance that they received. Musa and Ramadan, indeed after being arrested in 2014, alleged being tortured and sexually assaulted by Central Investigation Directorate officers, aiming at coercing them to confess. As a result, after Musa forcibly signed the confession, they were both sentenced to death with no due process guarantees, apparently. And evidence of torture being committed against these two victims do exist, but however, it has been continuously disregarded by the judiciary authorities in Bahrain. What makes these cases particularly emblematic is the fact that in 2018, the Bahraini Court of Cassation overturned the death sentences of Musa and Ramadan following evidence uh, that the crime of torture had been effectively committed against them. But nevertheless, with no further investigation nor new evidence, the Court of Appeal reinstated the death sentences of Musa and Ramadan. And very recently, in July 2020, the Court of Cassation definitely upheld these death sentences. So right now, Musa and Ramadan, as well as the other 10 victims, have exhausted all their legal remedies. And as a result, despite all the international pressure, their files have been transmitted to the King of Bahrain. And as soon as the King will sign the executive orders, these victims will be at imminent risk of being unjustly executed. In conclusion, we believe that the international community and especially the Human Rights Council have a major responsibility to hold Bahrain accountable for its responsibility to yield the commitment of the Bahrain government to the respect of all human rights. Bahrain, as we were mentioning before, is a member of the Human Rights Council and thus should be held to a even higher standard with regard to the respect of human rights. We think that the Human Rights Council needs to take action towards Bahrain's policies, and not only in the sense of joint statement, but to the extent of adopting an actual resolution, specifically addressing the ongoing systematic human rights violations in the country. Only then, with a strong message, the Bahraini government may understand that the international community and the Human Rights Council are serious about addressing the current troubling situation. Also, um, there cannot be a serious cooperation between the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and the government of Bahrain without effective partnership with the civil society within Bahrain and outside Bahrain. Some steps necessarily need to be achieved in order to move towards improvement in the country. And these are the release of all political prisoners, the halt of all unjust capital execution, and the ensured accountability of all human rights violation, violators, no matter their rank. Without the achievement of these steps, any agreement or cooperation established with the 
be, between the High Commissioner and Bahrain will not have any positive or fruitful outcome. And the human rights situation in the country will relentlessly, con relentlessly continue to deteriorate. And we need to avoid this. Thank you for Thank your you. attention. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Emily. Um, I wanted to say that, I mean, considering also the extent of the various recommendations you've addressed and as well as the, uh, uh, I mean, comprehensive uh, analysis of, of the overall uh, situation, um, um, I have also uh, shared within the chat uh, the letter uh, that I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, session uh, that is addressed to members of the Human Rights Council for each and everyone to have a look at it if you haven't yet uh, and to also share it and spread it around uh, with the view to strengthen the advocacy that is uh, uh, aimed and necessary uh, at this session of the of the council uh, I, I will now give the floor to our last speaker um, sue willman um, Sue is a practicing lawyer in the United Kingdom. She's working on human rights cases in the Gulf, more precisely. Um, she's also the chair of the Law Society Human Rights Committee and assistant director of the King's College London Legal Clinic. Um, and so Sue, um, I mean, building on what has been said uh, previously and on in the analysis also shared by Emily, can you also give us a uh, share with us your analysis on on what international mechanisms have been used to address the situation, human rights situation in, in in Bahrain. What impact have these had, and 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 maybe more precisely, uh, what legal strategies could be used? Uh, Emily mentioned the question of sanctions. Uh, uh, we'd be interested to hear what can us lawyers or even non-lawyers could do to support. Um, uh, various actions um, today. Sue, so you will need to unmute your microphone. Sorry. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Welcome. Thank you. Um, it's hard to believe that I've been involved in legal work um, on Bahrain since the London 2012 Olympics, when we took some legal action to try to prevent Prince Nasser from carrying the Bahrain flag at the opening ceremony. During those years, I've learned a lot from activists like Khalid, Ibrahim and Hussein Abdullah and others here today. And the most important one is that a very small success is cause for celebration. Paraphrasing the words of Al-Hadi Al-Khawaja to his daughter, Mariam, the struggle for freedom and democracy is a long one. It may take more than one lifetime. So I'm going to talk about some of the strategies that we've used in the past eight years and things that have worked and things that might not have worked so well. Um, but I thought it might start, it might be worth starting by thinking about what we're trying to do to effect change to influence the government and that has obviously got a uh, wider application to other governments sometimes it's about reputation in the UN and in the international sphere which can influence a repressive regime and sometimes it's economic pressure or governmental pressures um, so all that feeds into the legal strategy and uh, these legal mechanisms only work with persuasion and diplomacy. And obviously it's for us to try and convince the US and UK and other governments to take action via public opinion, which is generated uh, by the press. And the thing about a legal case is that even if you lose a legal case, it can often generate a good amount of press. And that's something to bear in mind, not that we start cases intending to lose them. Um, so we Me voy a comer este jabón. Ay, no será. We've um, been using UN, people have been using UN mechanisms and Emily has kind of described the, the causes for them quite regularly and quite efficiently uh, on behalf of detainees like Al-Khawaja 
over several years, whether whether we've used complaints to the UN Working Group on arbitrary detention or um, looked at the Committee Against Torture or the Special Rapporteur on Torture, Juan Mendez. But of course, Bahrain has refused to accept any UN Special Rapporteurs since 2007. And a visit by Juan Mendez was cancelled in 2013. Um, universal periodic review reports and side reports have been used and like the letter of today, various um, approaches to the Human Rights Council. Um, I think there've been 18, according to ADHRB, there've been 89 communications through the special procedures. Um, and in the meantime, Bahrain has basically been ignoring the UN or apparently ignoring the UN. Um, but I wonder if even though we can't see direct results of these kind of complaints and any press that we can generate as part of a wider campaign, perhaps it is a kind of bulletproof vest to prevent further ill treatment of prisoners and part of a wider strategy to help with release or to get medical treatment and query whether it had an effect in Nabil Rajab's case. Of course, the UN difficulty is that they don't have any enforcement mechanism. They don't have enough resources even to prior, even to deal with all of the complaints. They have to prioritize complaints. Um, and that's the problem with soft law mechanisms. But we have made good use of something called an OECD complaint, which is a complaint which is brought um, against a multinational company um, partly again to attract publicity and to influence the company to the OECD, which is the uh, Organization of Economic Development. The procedure is you complain to the national contact point of the country where the company is registered. So for example, a complaint was made by uh, BIRD, Bahrain Institute for Rights and Democracy based in the UK, uh, to Formula One um, who run their race uh, regularly in Bahrain, and that led to activists meeting with the organisers of Formula One and uh, pressing their human rights concerns on them. And more recently, a similar complaint's been made to those involved in organising the Royal Windsor Horse Show, which um, uh, the King and Prince Nasser regularly attend every year, not this year, of course, due to COVID, and, and the, the Queen Elizabeth also attends. Um, so that, that complaint is ongoing, but at least that's a, a way of um, forcing people to the table and no doubt causing some concern to the regime. Um, but one of the main aims or one of the main strategies that has been used is to try and take action against those who are actually responsible for the senior serious human rights abuses, including the ill treatment of prisoners. So, for example, making international travel more difficult. Universal jurisdiction cases, which are about prosecutions for torture, are, are very difficult. And there have only been uh, about two successful um, prosecutions in the UK in the last almost 40 years. And currently, the most high, high profile case is being brought in Germany against uh, Syrians. And the reason those cases are difficult is because the person who's responsible for the torture needs to be in the UK or, or the country where the police are doing the investigation. Uh, and also witnesses uh, need to be willing to come to a criminal court hearing and be able to give direct evidence of, of the torture. Um, so, so far, Prince Nasser hasn't been seen in a criminal court in the UK, but as Emily mentioned, uh, the case initially brought against him resulted in allegations of his torture being read out in the High Court and international press and the decision that he wasn't immune from prosecution. Uh, and there were then talks between him and uh, UK ministers in Bahrain, presumably reassuring him. But it certainly showed that the court took those kind of complaints seriously. Anyway, the main thing I wanted to talk about today uh, is about a new tool for human rights lawyers and international NGOs, and that's the Magnitsky sanctions. It all started in the US again in 2012 when uh, a Russian lawyer 
um, was arrested in 2008 and denied medical care and tortured in police custody for 11 months so that he died. That led to the US passing a flagship act called the Magnitsky Act, and they then went on to impose visa bans and asset freezes on the Russian officials who were um, involved. Uh, the senator behind the act then went on to urge other countries to pu- uh, pass similar acts. So Canada has got an act which it passed in 2017 called the Justice for Victims of Corrupt Foreign Officials Bill. And also Estonia, Lithuania, Latvia, Kosovo have acts. Um, and the EU, Australia, Ukraine, uh, Moldova and Georgia are in the process of debating acts in their parliaments. So what about the UK? Well, at the annual Conservative conference to a couple of years ago, Dominic Rabb, who's now the Foreign Secretary, said, we will bring into force a UK Magnitsky at law to place visa bans and asset freezes on those individuals deemed responsible for serious human rights abuses, including torture. Um, the British Parliament passed an amendment to uh, a sanctions act to give the government the power to impose sanctions on people who commit gross human rights violations. But it wasn't until this July that the regulations appeared to make this law. Then there was more rhetoric from Dominic Rabb. Those with blood on their hands won't be free to waltz into this country, to buy up property on the King's Road, to do their Christmas shopping in Knightsbridge, or siphon dirty money through British banks. All of that might bring the uh, Bahraini regime to mind. So he announced the set of sanctions and they were fairly fairly obvious uh, enemies of the UK or at least fairly obvious human rights targets like the people involved in killing um, uh, the Saudi Arabian journalist uh, Khashoggi in Turkey, North Korea for their gulag camps, Venezuela for limiting free speech and blocking websites. Again, that might sound familiar. And um, several dozens of individuals will now have their assets frozen in the UK and be banned from entering the country. How exactly does it work? Well, it's called the Global Human Rights Sanctions Regulations of 2020 and the Foreign Secretary must have reasonable grounds to suspect that an individual is involved in an activity which, if carried out by a state, would amount to a serious violation of the right to life or the right not to be subjected to torture or cruel, inhuman or degrading treatment or punishment. And that's certainly what we've been hearing about today in the Gulf. The process is for people with information about the uh, alleged activity to write to the Foreign Office and on the Foreign Office's website there's guidance for NGOs and a list of the Foreign Office's current human rights priorities. So you may think that all that takes us back to the beginning, which is about raising awareness through events like today, through press and pressure on um, lawmakers, on public opinion, so the Foreign Office might have to think they do might think they need to do something about Bahrain, as well as very as well as very careful research, uh, and of course telling human stories of people like Al Khawaja. It's definitely not an easy road, but there's certainly scope for the international community to act and make a difference through these types of activities. And I hope we can have some more um, discussion about that um, now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sue. This is very uh, um, useful for us advocates. Um, so we've gone beyond uh, the uh, one hour slot that we had, but um, given that we've only had the presentation so far, I, I, I would recommend we could have a um, uh, an opportunity for questions and answers. Um, should um, should you want to ask a question or raise a question, please uh, raise your hand in the participants uh, box. Um, uh, and I will give the floor to who raises a hand. You may also uh, write a, a question in your chat uh, that is um, 
made available here uh, where uh, we I could also um, raise such questions. Alors, do we have any hands raised? Yes, Michael Kambata from GCHR. Uh, and so, yeah, well, I've just introduced you, but uh, for those who take the floor, kindly introduce yourself as well and, and tell us to whom you would want to address your question. Thank you very much. Michael, you have the floor. Unmute. Uh, I think you can hear me now. Um, th uh, thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. Um, Sue, I, I would like to go back to, to your comment about the, the Magnitsky-like act in the UK. And, and you, you talked a bit about the process, but could you give any insight as to how you think uh, the, the political side can interfere with, with that? What, what leeway or what, what, um, what leeway does the government have if, 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 if a strong case is, is presented and they either want to or want not to, to proceed? Hi. Um, I suppose the starting point is um, the reports that the Foreign Office makes about Bahrain and other countries in the Gulf. And the difficulty is that they, those have been fairly muted. Um, so I think it's about um, lobbying conservative, in particular, politicians about the circumstances in the Gulf. Obviously, we don't think that Boris Johnson's going to be uh, much of an ally, but perhaps uh, Dominic Raab might be open to some kinds of persuasion. Uh, and it's going to be difficult to get sanctions through unless the Foreign Office have already decided that Bahrain is a country where human rights violations are taking place, which is why I put the emphasis on evidence as well, because um, of lots of the people who are suffering are still in jail or have come out of jail and are not able to speak about it. And the more direct evidence that we have, the more possibility there is. Uh, and then it goes to a number of organisations joining forces to write to the government. Um, and so that hopefully would mean amnesty, um, Human Rights Watch, those kind of organisations joining with organisations that work specifically on the Gulf. And I'm not sure if they are currently convinced that that's the best approach as opposed to a behind doors approach or at least trying a behind doors approach, first of all. But if a, if a large um, group of NGOs and international NGOs wrote the letter asking for sanctions, I think that would give it extra strength. And then at the moment, we don't know if the government's going to exclude the decision from being judicially reviewed. If the decision could be judicially reviewed, uh, then obviously that gives us a, a legal option to challenge it, which would be fantastic, but no doubt the government will try to exclude that. Hope that's helpful. Is there any other question? Um, Please raise your hand if you do so. I'll, I'll take the floor also to further expand on what Sue has been saying as far as universal jurisdiction is concerned um, and, and share with everyone a, a resource guide which um, an organization called Tri International together with uh, FIDH and other uh, organizations involved in uh, prosecuting authors of uh, torture acts of international crimes abroad using universal jurisdiction. Um, every year, um, uh, trial publishes um, a survey, a review of uh, the way uh, those mechanisms evolve and develop. And I think it's a useful resource uh, for activists who are seeking to uh, use the jurisdiction and the courts to prosecute uh, here, Bahraini authorities uh, uh, abroad. So I'll share this in the chat. Um, in the meantime, I'd seen a hand raised, which just disappeared. James Bash. 
Hello, um, I'm an advocacy assistance intern with the ADHRB. Uh, my question is to Devin Kinney. Um, considering uh, the Turkey's role as a regional power, do you think they have any role to play in the situation in Bahrain? Okay, I should be unmuted now. Um, thanks, James. Uh, it's, it's an interesting question. It's always good to raise these questions and think outside the boxes of what we're doing. Um, Turkey's definitely really regionally influential. To my knowledge, though, they don't really have um, very tight bilateral relations with Bahrain. Um, so that's kind of what you'd want to look for from an advocacy perspective is where are these pressure points and bilateral relations that are that are quite strong and that are regarded as strategic by the target country, in this case, Bahrain. Um, so it could bear a little more investigation, but to the best of my knowledge, uh, anything like arms or financial transfers or crucial political support from Turkey to Bahrain is absent. Um, in my view, probably the largest pressure point that's actually accessible on Bahrain would be US arms transfers. Um, but I would not expect anything to happen on that for as long as Trump is in office. Um, but yeah, it's a good question, food for thought. Thank you. Yes, we have Luca Beckett. Yes, uh, so my question is not directed to anyone specifically, but I was wondering about the possible consequences of the uh, normalization deals between uh, Israel, Bahrain, and uh, the uh, Emirates uh, for, for, for the human rights defender and human rights situation at large in, in Bahrain, specifically uh, considering that the US are a very strong ally of those three countries. Yeah, that's a good comment, but I don't know if anyone would wanna comment on this. Uh, well, Malik. I... Yeah, I could talk about uh, normalization in terms of the history of uh, digital cooperation. Surveillance, the Israeli company that has branches in UK and other countries, the SNO, uh, really they supported uh, Saudi Arabia and the United Arab Emirates in particular. So such a norm normalization could lead to more surveillance on online activisms. So it could have a negative uh, impact, but uh, this should not uh, take us uh, far from the uh, very heart of the picture, which is always we have to defend the rights of the people of Palestine. They have no future, no jobs, discrimination, attacks on daily basis. So. As defenders, we can't open an eye for a, a violation and close it uh, on other violations. So we are here just to show our solidarity with the people of Palestine and their rights to have a prosperous future and to raise our concerns that such normalization will give oppressive governments another opportunity to put more restrictions on online activism. Thank you. Antonio, if I, if I may intervene on this. Um, of course, the, the relationship, the security relationship between Bahrain and Israel has been going on for years. Officials uh, uh, from the uh, Bahraini government have met publicly and privately with uh, the foreign ministry of Israel, with security officials with Israel. There are uh, some pictures that service. Even the king himself met uh, Shimon Perez in New York on uh, multiple occasions, there was a news story 
that the king last year met with ben uh, Benjamin uh, or Benjamin uh, Benjamin Netanyahu in Hungary. So the the uh, relationship now just been officialized serve, uh, or serviced publicly. Uh, it's been rejected by, I'm not gonna say, uh, I don't have a percentage, but I can at least comfortably say by majority of the Bahraini uh, 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 people, uh, uh, at least the uh, political society, the civil society in the country. Uh, it's been uh, a hot topic in the country where the government actually kind of taken the back seat, like they announced it, but they're not really uh, uh, pushing for it in a way, you know, it's, it's like they're, they're kind of ashamed, but the, the, the fear is by uh, human rights defenders in the country. Now, the, there'll be a heavy hand approach by the government uh, 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 and, and similar tactic that been used by uh, used by uh, Israeli forces against the Palestinian uh, uh, being transferred into Bahrain. Uh, th there is also a study uh, done by a Kuwaiti think tank. Uh, I just uh, 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 skimmed it that Bahrain is going to use this relationship with Israel to kind of uh, protect uh, uh, the government, protect itself from any kind of future uprising. Now, again, as, as we all know, th there is a, a minority ruling a majority in the country, and there is a unified or a national opposition to some extent uh, in the country, uh, regardless of the sect. But there is a ruling family that is, is, is gripping on power, and they believe that normalization with Israel is going to bring even further uh, support to their uh, uh, ruling to Bahrain, even if one day the United States decide to leave the Gulf because it no longer uh, poses that strategic uh, oil uh, uh, supply because they might, the US might have its own oil. So uh, normaliza normalization with Israel is causing a serious concern. It is rejected strongly by Bahraini. As a Bahraini myself, I'm, I'm rejecting this deal because it does not represent the will of the people. The government of Bahrain has uh, broken the social contract between uh, uh, the people of Bahrain and the government Al Khalifa when they rejected the constitution of 1973 and, and came up with their own constitution. And when they heavy handedly uh, 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 attacked the pro democracy movement, uh, throwing in prison the uh, religious, cultural, uh, uh, social leader, political leaders. Uh, uh, in the uh, in the country. Thank you. Maybe any other further questions? Yes, um, Juliette Denis Senez, please um, introduce yourself if you agree. Hello, I don't know if you can hear me and see me. Yes, yes, we hear and um, see. Okay. Um, I'm also an advocacy intern at uh, ADHRB. And I think my question also is addressed to uh, everyone, but um, would you think that this crisis, the sanitary crisis at the moment presents some sort of an opportunity window to particularly raise awareness and maybe also develop some sort of leverage from the public opinion, which I think we, we see some sort of like a, a new consciousness uh, that's arising from the public opinion worldwide because people are paying a bit more attention to the choices that they make, to uh, situations and how the sanitary crisis is uh, being dealt with in other parts of the world. And, and yeah, I think my question is, do you think that this is a particular moment where there is a way of using this crisis to kind of address the picture of a uh, political prisoner situation in Bahrain? Mm, would anyone want to respond to this? I mean, I, I, I can already give some preliminary elements of answer. I mean, Firstly, to mention that the uh, a number of people uh, in Bahrain, um, detained individuals, 
have been released uh, in the first weeks, uh, have been released from prison in the first weeks uh, of uh, the COVID pandemic. Um, uh, but these were uh, mainly, uh, uh, I mean, ordinary criminals. Um, uh, a few of them, and one of them has been um, um, uh, uh, our colleague Nabil Rajab. Um, uh, but when we have called for further mobilization on further human rights defenders to be released, uh, these uh, uh, calls have fallen into deaf ears. Um, uh, what also the pandemic uh, builds uh, and what we can think of is indeed that um, there is a a growing concern, and you agree with you, Juliette, with the fact that we may want to use this opportunity of a heightened um, sensitivity to what is happening, and uh, maybe a heightened awareness of what is happening around the world. And we 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 could use uh, that opportunity to to strengthen our civil society uh, mobilization. Um, this would also need to counterbalance the impact that the uh, uh, COVID crisis has had on our governments, uh, notably uh, uh, democracies whom we could expect uh, to be stronger, have a stronger stance uh, on the human rights situation in Bahrain, who are now uh, entering a, a phase of economic recession or economic crisis. And for those reasons, will often prioritize economic interests over geopolitical concerns. So um, uh, while there could be a greater civil society mobilization uh, in this context, uh, this is probably necessary due to the fact that governments themselves may uh, choose not to prioritize, I mean, or find another reason not to prioritize uh, the protection of human rights over economic interests. But that was um, only from my own perspective. I don't know if others. Um, I don't know if others want to comment on this. Uh, well, I just want to add a very important uh, aspect to this discussion: whether we pick this opportunity or another opportunity. Uh, the reality so far: the Bahraini government uh, haven't. Uh, uh, being ready to start a real reform. It is not uh, that difficult. Abdelhadi has pain in his face. He should get an operation two years ago. It is very easy for them to do that. Abdelhadi could go to Denmark to get and start his life and get some uh, proper medical care, but they are not ready to do that. They could release all the prisoners, including activists, due to the second wave of COVID-19. They are not ready to do that. The fact that there is no any local remedy to address that, what left for us, just international advocacy, taking into account that we know that the unconditional support given by US and UK to oppressive governments in our region, including the Bahrain government, is really the main reason why our colleagues are still in prison. So we need to address that. We need to end this unconditional support. We need to talk to US and UK. The uh, whole human rights uh, movement, uh, the global human rights movement, the UN uh, uh, mechanisms, all, all, all uh, the tools, we have to come together to have a strategy to address this uh, human rights crisis. It is painful to see somebody, innocent defender and innocent activist to be in prison for 10 years. It is lifetime. So uh, uh, often people will come to us, oh, your colleagues are still in prison. What are you doing there? We, we have to continue our work. We have to be uh, really ready uh, to ch change the way we are acting, to work with each other, to address all this uh, uh, crisis and some new approaches to uh, get success. We have to end cooperation between Western democracies and oppressive governments. We need to put the human rights uh, in the first place. We need to really implement the EU guidance on the protection of human rights defenders. There are a lot of work working us. We have to continue our work. We are not really going to be uh, stopping anything. In actual fact, we are going to focus more uh, on our work 
until we get uh, success. The change is coming, but it will take time and uh, it will take a lot of our efforts. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, Khalid. And I think this uh, uh, can also be uh, uh, concluding comments for us uh, as a call for further mobilization. Um, um, what, what I keep in mind also from the discussions we've had here today um, is that uh, when governments or in elected governments in democracies uh, fear or are reluctant to mobilize and use uh, 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 the leverages that are available to uh, strengthen uh, influence over the Barony government, we uh, as activists can use uh, and strengthen the leverages within those democracies uh, to either use the courts or to use uh, direct advocacy for individual sanctions. Uh, there's a growing uh, call for this and, and, and probably a, a greater number of opportunities to do so uh, in various countries since uh, these uh, possibilities have been developing with the deployment of the Magnitsky regulations in several countries. So I think we have good um, uh, food for thought for follow up in our respective advocacies and, uh, or litigating activities. Um, there is an important session happening right now in the Human Rights Council and, and I would like to thank uh, ADHRB and BCHR for having initiated GCHR. this discussion. Did I, did I, I said GCHR, yes, not BCHR. Apologies, uh, Khalid, uh, GCHR and ADHRB for having um, organized uh, this discussion uh, for the organizations uh, who, uh, alongside you, have called on the Human Rights Council in the letter we've we, we've shared here. Um, I, I, I well, uh, let's let's make the most of our respective efforts to to develop uh, the various uh, uh, statements, mobilizations, and decisions that. Uh, can be taken in the hands of uh, uh, an important of powerful uh, uh, entities uh, with a view to leveraging influence uh, over the Barony government. Uh, at long last, uh, thank you uh, for those who uh, behind uh, jail doors and maybe uh, this message can be sent back to them. Uh, we were very numerous today, uh, I mean, close to 60 uh, throughout the, 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 the session. May they hear that um, we are uh, mobilizing and we uh, heard their call and we will not uh, um, be defeated until they uh, are released. Voilà. Thank you very much to everyone. I see that just there is just a last minute question, but uh, yeah. um, Leila, yes. Please. Sorry. Um, hello, everyone. I am an intern with AD, ADHRB. Uh, so Mr. Khalid Ibrahim mentioned Denmark. Well, Denmark is involved in Abdul Hadi uh, Al Khawaja uh, situation. And as a country that showed a great commitment in human rights, uh, what do you think Denmark should do in order to... Uh,